All right, we are locked and loaded for another exciting episode of the George Business Radio Show on Pro Business Channel Studios here in Atlanta. And uh, we have a distinguished guest here joining us uh, from the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Uh, quite a uh, robust bio here. Um, we would read it, but we run out of time for conversation. Yeah, I've heard it before. <laughs> You've heard it before. Nice. So Tom Cunningham, he's a senior uh, vice president and chief economist at the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce here in Atlanta, um, following a 30-year career at the Federal Reserve. Um, uh, what stories, can, you probably have a lot of stories you can share and not share on that regard, right? It was an interesting time. Uh, yeah. the, the financial crisis uh, was challenging. Yeah, what era was that um, you covered? Uh, I came right out of graduate school wow. in uh, 85 and uh, spent 30 years there and retired and okay. then uh, was drafted by the Metro Atlanta Chamber <laughs> to come and do good things for the metro area. They have a way of doing that. Do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're good. Yeah. Yes, it's a lot of fun. So you've traveled quite a bit with uh, job, career, uh, school, and so forth. And um, so right out of the gates, uh, when we were looking at your bio, I, I couldn't believe it. But uh, not only a uh, native of Reedley, California, which and I spent about 10 years in Fresno. That's just up the road, right? Yes. And then... And um, that's just up the road. There, right? <laughs> yes. Exactly, yeah. 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 <laughs> on uh, 99, right? That's where you go to dinner. Yeah, or <laughs> right. let's say out there on V99, uh, yeah. I-99, yeah. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is um, Fresno State. So I spent some time at Fresno State, and uh, apparently you did as well. Yeah, I did my undergraduate there. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so we, Bulldogs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Go FSU Bulldogs. Yeah, right. right. We were talking about before we went on the air. I have a uh, bulldog hat that says FSU Bulldogs. Really confuses people here in the South. And when Fresno State was doing very well yeah. in uh, the the uh, College World Series, right, yeah. uh, I wore all my Fresno regalia all over the southeast when I was at the Fed, and right. people had no idea what was right. going on. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, so good times there, so we'll talk, yeah. we may have crossed paths, we may have been there at the same time, so, um, but uh, besides that, so you went on uh, after Fresno State to a um, uh, PhD in, at Columbia? Yes, yeah, spent uh, six years in, in New York City. Okay. Uh, met my wife, who's also an economist. Oh, really? Uh, wow. yeah, that's she's a, interesting dinner, con a, dinner conversation, yeah. Uh, that's one way of looking <laughs> yeah. at it, yes. Our kids are interesting. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just, so speaking of kids, uh, so what's their career path? Where are they at? In their stage uh, of life one, of them, one, one of them, my daughter, is at Penn State. Okay. Uh, she's a fencer. Uh, really? Yeah, for what it's worth. Um, Atlanta is a center of women's saber fencing that uh, there's an amazing coach here, um, and uh, he is a, a dominant player and has established a dominant club. Right. Um, and so, yeah, she was on the U.S. national team, traveled uh, wow. all over the place, and now she's at Penn State. Um, but this is a hub for um, little-known fact or trivia, right? Uh, for, yeah, saber fencing, particularly uh, women's saber. Okay. Um, but, but, yeah, saber generally. And my son is... Uh, doing IT uh, in a company in Douglasville. Okay. Uh, he went through Emory a couple of years ago, a few years ago now. Right. And not surprisingly, a, a math econ dual major. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah. And you spent some so, time at Emory as well. Yes. Yeah. So it all I, comes I full there, circle. Um, you know, on an you didn't teach him at any point. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, and he will tell you that quite explicitly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. So, um, so that brings us a little up to speed on a bit of your background, and again, we'll post the remaining uh, uh, information on our show notes and so forth. So, um, so now fast forward before we get into the economy, the national uh, employment situation. Um, talk to us about the MAC, as as it's known here in Georgia, the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Uh, really, the MAC Daddy of Chambers. Uh, what is it? Twenty some odd, twenty seven counties, or how many? Uh, yeah, we're in the uh, twenty nine county metropolitan area. Wow. MSA. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're not kind of a typical chamber of commerce, although, of course, those, those are our roots. We're heavily engaged in uh, policy uh, and business development. Right. We're promoting the, the metro Atlanta area. Um, you know, we have a, a very aggressive program that's been cranked up recently called Cheese ATL. Yeah. That is bringing... Uh, Kate, really Kate Atwood. Shout yeah, out Kate out. Atwood. And, um, you know, the FIA um, online... Um, kind of streaming videos. Yeah. Uh, that's all of the stuff is is designed to kind of make the the business climate in the metro region um, yeah. as inviting as possible. Yeah. Shout out to Kate. We have a, a bit of a history that um, 
shared in her uh, original venture, her nonprofit, had a similar personal life experience of what what she, uh, you know, brought to that community. Uh, actually, back in the back in the day when I was at a local DJ, DJ her first uh, <laughs> music uh, for music at her first uh, fundraiser event. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So we've yeah. known each other for a while, and then yeah. it's amazing what she's done with uh, Choose Atlanta. Yeah, right. HBO. Yeah. Um, so, um, so it is a, a different dynamic than uh, I hate to say your typical chamber, but not only the um, the deltas and the Home Depots and so forth. But I, I like the interesting perspective of I don't know when they made this pivot. Um, a, a bit of a new you know nuance, but from a membership to uh, considering the members investors. Um, I can't really address that because it happened before yeah, yeah. I arrived there, yeah. but but that is true. I think it's I, a great. I think, I think it's a perfectly reasonable view of yeah. what's going on. Because you feel, uh, I mean, literally, figuratively, invested in that organization. Well, it's an investment in the, the vibrancy right. of the metro area. Right. I, I think that's that's a fair characterization. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that comes from a chief economist, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, we're concerned about a, a thriving economy, and that's what we're engaged in creating Well, that's sustaining. Well, that's a good um, segue then. So... Uh, speaking of our economy in Georgia, we'll talk about national as well. But in terms of uh, uh, Georgia economy, what are our challenges? Uh, we we we, a lot of, we hear a lot of praises and how amazing what's going on. So we'll talk about that obviously. But what you know what um, where's area we can where's areas we can improve in? But what what are our challenges? Well, business climate is always a problem. Um, that the ability to kind of uh, maintain our reputation as a welcoming state for everybody is, is um, you know potentially problematic. Uh, at times, that's something. Now, what that, do you attribute that to? Um, well, you know, politics can be a, a, a problem now and then. Um, you know, that's just how life is. Yeah. Uh, we do want to make sure that everybody views us as a welcoming environment, because um, one of our major uh, challenges, in a, in a deep sense, is attracting talent. Right. This isn't a, so much an issue of kind of the, the um, growing, getting people to grow up and, and be engineers here, although right. that would help a lot, right? Is that as we see the metro area grow at a faster pace than the rest of the nation over a long period of time, the only way the area, right. and if people don't view it as an attractive place to come, they won't, right. and then we're in trouble. So it's a bit of a PR job then as well, right? Well, I for the chamber, it, it, it's an awareness yeah. job that I think the actual quality of life here is is quite high, and it's more a matter of getting people aware of the enormous uh, set of choices that are available to people moving into the area and the, the overall quality of life. Um, we're not making this stuff up. Right. That that uh, one of the nice things that's happened as we've seen corporate relocations and Mercedes Benz in particular was pretty good about That's looking. That's a big win, yeah. Yeah, but it was, they came and looked around at, at the neighborhoods and, you know, said, look, within, you know, a, a relatively short commute, you could be in, you know, an urban setting in Midtown, yeah. you could be on a horse farm in Conyers, <laughs> right, yeah. um, and you can afford to do most of this stuff. Yeah. Um, it, there's an enormous variety of lifestyle choices that are available here that you can actually do that are not uh, true in a, a, a lot of our competing cities. Yeah, you look at you know like uh, the, those competing markets, and they have they check a lot of boxes. But some of their challenges on their on their um, uh, you know list, if you will, would be um, you know not just traffic because every major city has right. that right. So just right. you can almost kind of uh, take that off the list, right? But right. it's it's the climate uh, in terms of weather is and and the business climate as well. Mm. Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I mean we had. Um, before he was Attorney General, Chris Carr, as Commissioner of um, uh, Economic Development for the state of Georgia, talking about uh, Georgia being a very pro-business state. Yes. Right? Yeah, that's part of the business climate that that uh, we lobby hard to maintain. We are a very pro-business state, um, legislatively and, and, you know, in cost of doing business. Right. Um, the simple fact is that it costs less to do business here than it does in pretty much any other state. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, and I, I think, again, this is not so much, a, well, it is a marketing issue. It's making yeah. people aware of what is here, that if you look at the overall cost of doing business, we end up being rated in any kind of 
you know, credible ratings sense right. um, as, as the best state to do business in. Well, we love um, anything that's pro-business, being the pro-business channel. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Uh, the, this is not accidental right, right, right. That, that we are here because we have, you know, made decisions along the way to be pro-business and, and to have a thriving economy. Yeah, it's a, it's a very concerted effort by a lot of uh, moving, you know, parts and parties. I mean, uh, I mean, you look at, um, we had a representative in talking about the, uh, you know, one in industry in particular, which is a lot of people are aware of just because of its presence and its notoriety, the uh, film and television production yes. industry, $7.2 billion revenue stream and for it, the state, right? Right. And, you know, it gets bigger, yeah. you know, over time <laughs> right. rapidly. An another kind of underappreciated aspect of that is the esports uh, component okay. that is growing spectacularly and is just enormous. I mean, um, you know, the Twitch network has hundreds of millions of, of viewers, right. and you know, the the it, it's not. Do they have a footprint here? Um, pretty significant. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, Turner is is doing no, some but stuff. Twitch. Yeah. Oh no, no. Okay, yeah. But but the that premise, the, whatever. The, yeah. The esports group. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a studio up um, in Norcross yeah. that that holds you know competitions that right, are right. shown on Twitch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so this is something that that is ongoing here and growing rapidly. Yeah, a little you know on topic, off topic, but uh, you know in terms of gaming, which uh, is not I don't think is either one of our wheelhouse you know on a regular daily basis, but is just a massive. Uh, burgeoning industry, uh, almost uh, separate from the film and television, right? It's an interactive experience. I mean, where where do we come? Where do we? Well, it does. Any idea where it we does compete? qualify under the yeah. the uh, you yeah. know creative tax credits, yeah. okay, which really? is very fortunate that oh, really? kind of the designers, the digital media stuff, right. um, gets that incentive. And so we're seeing studios relocate here because of the tax incentives, also because it's just a better place to be. That yeah. that if you think about the other kind of major hubs, Los Angeles, right. um, talent's a problem there. Yeah. That we have Georgia Tech, we right. have SCAD. Yeah, um, we produce compared to the size of the market, a, a relatively large supply of, of fresh, highly skilled uh, graduates in that field. And so this is, you know, one of those things again that people are are kind of unaware right, of. Right, right. That, you know, if you look at, at graduate engineering programs that are kind of in the top 10, um, Georgia Tech by itself has more graduate engineers than Berkeley and Stanford combined. You're serious. Um, wow. And again, people don't understand that. And it's not that we need to kind of, you know, make stuff up. We need to get the word out. And, you know, so you talk to uh, people in our various, um, you know, tech sectors, and they'll say, you know, look, it's very hard to get top tier talent anywhere but it's easier here than it is elsewhere. Um, difficult, right, but, yeah. but easier here than, than elsewhere because we are kind of the source of a large amount of, of top, right. top shelf talent. So before we move to uh, the National uh, Employment Situation Report and s some more uh, numbers on the economy, we've been talking about um, uh, the film, television, entertainment, you know, uh, attracting talent to, uh, to Georgia. Are you prepared to give a scoop on the official announcement of Amazon moving no, here yet? <laughs> no, I'm not. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Next topic, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about that whole process is that Atlanta is well poised to take that kind of inflow right. of jobs that, you know, you need a relatively large economy that has seen very, very rapid growth right. in the past. Right. And we have the kind of social infrastructure set up to be able to handle that, that right now we're adding jobs at around 40 or 50,000 a year, which is down considerably from, from uh, where we were a um, year and a half ago. But a year and a half ago, you know, we were seeing jobs added on a year-over-year -year basis of about 140,000 jobs. Wow. And the ability to absorb that kind of influx of, of job creation is something that not another lot of metros uh, have the capacity to do or have the experience doing. And, right. and we do. That can grow into that. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, but on the, uh, correct, you know, this Amazon, um, first, 
uh, genius effort on Jeff that he can get this kind of press for two years, right? Just the conversations about who's on the short list and who still remains, right? I don't know if that was all marketing or... Uh, but he's certainly getting a lot of mileage out of yeah, it, right? I, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, but talk about the structure. So um, if they're anticipating 50,000 employees. Well, then truly. Yeah, so it's yeah. not, at, you know, at once. Because I'm just thinking, you know, you look at most any city within the metro Atlanta area, there's no, you know, um, there's very few cities that even have that total population. I mean, right. I, I just moved from Sandy Springs. There's 40,000, but uh, but in, uh, eight, you know, during the work week, it, it balloons to 100,000. Um, but, I mean, that's that's like an entire, you know, city. Yeah, I, I think you really have to think about it as a metro area yeah. and not as an individual city. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got about 2.7 million workers right. in, in the metro Atlanta area. So as that kind of ramps up, we have the ability to handle to, that over to time. Yeah. That. yeah. Okay. All right. So you're listening to uh, Georgia Business Radio. Rich Casson over here alongside uh, Keith, uh, our uh, engineer. So far, so good, man. We doing okay? Uh, yeah, we're <laughs> doing great, Rich. Doing great, buddy. All right. Just want to do it. We'd like to do a sound check midpoint during the show. We're still on the air, right? Yeah. We're still live. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, um, and we're having a great conversation with uh, Tom Cunningham. He's the uh, senior vice president and chief economist at the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Uh, we're going to pivot now to. Um, uh, a combination of uh, the state and national outlook in terms of uh, jobs and employment. So some of the stats um, uh, you shared with us earlier, you mentioned that the uh, the job number gains, um, the nation added 213,000 jobs, well above the expectation of 190,000. Last month, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me talk about this in, in sort of a, a grand sense that yeah. would be really useful for particularly Atlanta uh, yeah. listeners. Um, the Atlanta economy has grown faster than the nation for a long period of time. Um, starting in the 60s, really, we were about the same size as Birmingham, and there was a great deal of competition between Birmingham and Atlanta. Birmingham had steel, uh, we had fizzy water, <laughs> and, and uh, it turned out that uh, one was better than the other, and around the time of uh, the civil rights movement, there was a real divergence. And I can't ascribe that to the civil rights movement per right. se, but it's a striking coincidence that starting in the 70s, Atlanta started to grow at a much faster pace than other cities in the southeast. Um, and by outgrowing, or in a, that sense, um, the rest of the nation for a long period of time, it had to be the case that we started to look like the rest of the nation, that we were taking in businesses and people from all over the country and, and to a large extent around the world. Um, and as that process happens, we look more like the rest of the nation. And so the reason I say all this is because when we talk about the Metro Atlanta outlook, it looks an awful lot like the national outlook on a little bit smaller scale but we are so closely aligned with kind of the industrial structure of the rest of the nation. I mean, there are obviously some areas where we're stronger than others. Right. Um, but by and large, that's not true. By and large, we have a very diverse economy that looks an awful lot like the rest of the nation. And so as a consequence, the risks to the national outlook are pretty much the same as the risks to the metro outlook. Right. And, and let me just throw out this is a cool factoid that... All right. Uh, <laughs> If you took the metro economy as an individual country, we're bigger than Ireland. Um, really? Not just not Georgia, just metro Atlanta? Just metro Atlanta. Um, people don't really appreciate how large the metro economy is. We're more than a third of a trillion dollars. And that puts us fairly high up in the list of countries, wow. if you think about that. And, and so that is an amazing factory. We need to hashtag we, that. Yeah. Yeah. So the deal is, you know, we're, we're big. Yeah. Um, and as you get big, it becomes harder and harder to kind of hang your hat on one particular industry right, yeah. that you have Which to is good and bad. Right. That, yeah. That's exactly right. And, and so when we talk about kind of job creation in the U S the Metro Atlanta is sort of a microcosm of that. Although there is this issue that kind of over time, since we've been growing at a faster pace than the rest of the nation, we do have to continue to attract people into the area. Now, over the last year, we've slowed a little bit. Right. Um, 
and what we have done is slowed to the pace of the rest of the nation. Okay. So it's not exactly <laughs> was that like intentional or just uh, uh, no? I, th- yeah. I, I think that was largely accidental. Uh, yeah. That we had an awful. Or maybe lot just of, a check, right? Um, well, well, you know, this is all random, and, yeah. and it, it's not all random. There's an underlying force to it, but kind of the the monthly numbers from one month to the next are have have an awful lot of noise. Seeing a little bit of slowdown from from the really breakneck pace of, yeah, yeah. of early last spring is not terribly surprising. Right. Um, but the issue is what's going to happen going forward. Um, nationally, um, in a formal sense, we have more job openings than we have people formally looking for work. And that's a good thing, right? Uh Maybe. Um, Yeah. I I mean, there there is... As opposed to the opposite. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is a relatively recent development, but having more job openings than unemployed people suggests that the real problem is that, um, you know, there are locational challenges and there are skill matching challenges. Right, yeah. Um, I think in a a deeper sense, kind of the the headline unemployment number um, probably is not the best possible measure of, of labor market slack. I think the, the broader measure of, of unemployment, which is called U6, that captures people that are working part-time because they can't find full-time work or yeah. disassociated and all that. that that's a larger right. pool of workers and probably explains why wages are not um, accelerating as rapidly as you might expect with a 4% unemployment rate. Right. Um, but the fact is that we have to be very cognizant of uh, workforce development here in the state to, you know, the fact that we have educational problems here in the, the region suggests that we're kind of leaving money on the table. Well, and that's that, a good point, too, because if we're not providing those opportunities for education and training, then those uh, folks are going to find it elsewhere, right? Well, and the, the local if population that, void. that, you know, we need workers. We right. need coders. Yeah. Um, that's stuff that could be taught in, you know, high school or, right. or you know, um, technical colleges. Uh, we have some fairly, well, we have a very good technical college system that, that addresses this stuff, but kind of primary and secondary education that doesn't prepare students for doing this. And we have very high um, high school dropout rates well, that, again, really in in my view are just kind of leaving money on the table that right. it's not good for them it's right. not good it's a, it's a kind of a social ill uh that really is starting to bite on on the business environment too so everybody would ripple, benefit yeah. right. if if uh we could kind of get our act together in in this area well, some conversations we've had with folks in the studio on this subject matter have been in the, um, the realm of being a little bit proactive on those secondary uh, schools, uh, the, the whole STEM uh, programs. Mm-hmm. <coughs> oh, yeah. Are really, um, you know, uh, get, we're going to see the benefits of that down the road, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a problem that we have, you know, this sort of generational issue of, you know, if you underinvest in, in education in, in some segments of, of your society you're going to pay for it later um, <laughs> you're going to pay for it later and it's a long-term process right. and and the big problem is that turning it around is costly it requires you to do different things right. and you don't see the benefits immediately right um and that's that's a big problem and but again you know it, 10 years ago and, and it is 10 years ago now in, when we were in the recession right um you know, business didn't really need to worry about this all that much because we had high unemployment and, and finding workers was not all that difficult. But now that's not the case. Yeah, you mentioned recession 10 years ago. Um, do you subscribe to, I mean, you're the expert on this, so uh, um, do you subscribe to this? Uh, is it an eight-year cycle? I know they talk about that in real estate, right? So um, in terms of the economy, you know, we're on a big um, uh, uptick right now i mean what yeah. triggers w- would set us in the wrong direction or is it, it just it just it's p- part of the market just correcting itself right I, th- I think um we've had a number of very long expansions over the last couple of cycles and that prompted a lot of work in the economics profession about cyclicality yeah. in the economy right and i think the clear answer is that expansions don't die of old age that something has to kill it Okay. Um, and that is some kind of shock. 
um, typically energy, but it could be financial, it could be tariffs. Uh, there are a lot of things out there. Right, that, yeah. But, but left to its own devices. Um, so it, do, it doesn't just uh, dwindle off on its own. There has to be some type of epic event, whether it be 9-11, which triggered a whole series, whether it be uh, the real estate, you know, um, um, y- you know, debacles that went on. And one final point, what about now is would you, I don't want to be a doomsday, but um, uh, if we don't have systems in check, the, you know, the next on the horizon, that could be that big disruptor to the economy, that, that have the ripple effect could be, we, we've had a, a world-renowned cyber experts here in a cybersecurity, and that's the next, um, on the rise in the terrorist issue, yeah. is not so much a, um, a physical bomb, but it's a digital bomb. That's certainly, right? I don't know, I just made up that term, is that a good term? Digital uh, bomb? I don't know. Yeah. Well, you'd have to ask the cyber <laughs> guys that. But that's, <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean. Uh, but that could uh, trigger a whole series. Uh, be- I mean, that when is you something, strike the grid, right? That's something you might want to worry about. Yeah. Certainly, I would worry a lot more about the consequences of the current round of, of trade yeah. uh, restrictions. That that doesn't seem to be slowing down, and um, <laughs> it's never worked out well in the past. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, I, that is something to really worry about. That um, worldwide trade destruct, yeah, disruption, we have, or even not so worldwide, just aimed at the United States, yeah. could be. Oh. Extremely disruptive. No, we recently just had on International Business Radio here in the studio the uh, general counsel uh, or general consulate uh, from the uh, Mexican chamber or uh, consulate office as well mm-hmm. as the Canadian uh, consulate yeah. um, talking about uh, NAFTA and, you know, there's some, and again, that's, it's a kind of what we talked about, the ripple effect of education. Put it, what you put it, what we're putting in motion today, um, if we don't correct those things, could be that next Issue yeah, or challenge. I, yeah, I, I, the immediate issue with NAFTA, I think, more than anything, or the, the one kind of big visible thing, although there are a lot of little or less visible things, not necessarily smaller, uh, is the auto industry. That the whole supply chain process of producing autos in North America is integrated across borders, and disrupting that with tariffs is not going to help anybody. Right. Um, that, you know. U.S. cars, I mean, the, kind of the standard um, factoid we like to cite is that Toyota Sienna has more U.S. content in it than a Ford Mustang. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, something that we really need to think hard about, that um, as, as product goes back and forth across the border in various stages of manufacture, it's very easy to, dis- to disrupt that uh, with negative consequences for, for everybody in the industry. Right. And that's not something that's going to help us at all. And uh, I think that many people don't think about Georgia being a big automotive uh, industry state, but I mean, with the port Savannah, um, and we just had the uh, Georgia and Automotive Manufacturing and, and Association Brunswick. in Brunswick. Yeah, Brunswick's a huge auto port, okay. both in and outbound. But I mean, um, they we we're, we're doing a conference in October for the, I think it's the Georgia uh, Manufacturing Association representing the automotive industry, and um, and. One of the things I'm just I'm thinking out, out loud here is um, the industry is being disrupted from the shared ride service, so it's less cars being mm-hmm. need to be purchased because a lot of people are, now are not don't feel the need to own a car as much as they need to or two or three cars for the family, and then now the whole scooter issue, right? Right, <laughs> right. There's That's, other modes of transportation that doesn't have to put you on four tires, right? That's certainly true. I, I mean, there is clearly going to be some some changes there. Um, uh, are we prepared I think those, for that in Georgia? I, because I, that's I, gonna th- I think those are a little bit more longer term yeah. than the problem of whether or not, you know, <laughs> cars get a 25% yeah, tariff, that's true, um, yeah. you know, in by the end of the year. Right. One of the things we don't recognize, I think, enough, or, or we're not cognizant enough of, is, is the large auto industry here. And it's not assembly. That We do have Kia as right, an assembly right. plant, and it's huge. But the, the money in autos is in components. And we do an awful lot of component manufacturing here. And then what the, the assemblers are a really sexy thing. Yeah, right, Because yeah. you can stand and see the cars <laughs> right, coming exactly. off the line. All the robots and everything else. Right, but, but it's the technology. But the money is in the components that right. go into the car. And they're brought in in trucks from manufacturers really? all over the place. And seeing those components manufacturers move to the southeast and, and a large number of them into Georgia, uh, something that's not very visible because... You know the the wiring harnesses and right, the dashboard yeah. assemblies are just 
they, you know, they don't make good photo ops, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but they're really pricey, and that's where the money is. Um, I can't believe we're almost out of time here, um, and uh, we got I, there, I got a lot of other points. We may need to bring you back because I okay. got so many other topics uh, on my mind. But anything else on your short list? I mean, we didn't get to uh, talk about retail, um, uh, but is there and uh, hourly earnings? Talk about that. That had a two point seven increase, right? Yeah, that's been uh, you know going back to the labor market issues. Um, slower than you would expect with a 4% unemployment rate. Right. But I think a large uh, component of that is this sort of gap between alternate measures of employment. And if you include workers that are working part-time, even though they'd like full-time work, yeah. or people who um, say they would like a job but, but haven't been looking in the last four weeks because they're discouraged, um, these are sources of, of labor that can come online without offering a higher wage. That you know you just offer a part-time worker more hours. You don't need to increase their hourly earnings. They just work more hours at, at prevailing wages. Right. Um, and until and and the trick is that these two measures. This is getting down in the weeds. But the two measures, the headline unemployment measure is called U3. And the larger, yeah, we talked about U6, but U3 Yeah, the is larger measure is U6, and the gap yeah. between those two blew up during the recession. Okay. Um, they had been kind of tracking fairly closely together, and really in, until that gap closes or gets back to where it was kind of by historical standards, right. I think we're likely to see kind of less than robust um, wage growth given the, the what appears to be a really tight labor market. Um, there are certainly areas of, of uh, the labor market that are really tight and are seeing you know, substantial uh, wage hikes. But across the board, um, I mean, we're still seeing um, compensation growing at less than 3% or hourly earnings growing at less than 3%. So as we see U3 and U6 um, um, sync up, if you will, or get close up that gap, then that's going to be a, a great think, indicator. I, I think we'll start seeing more wage pressure then. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, so Tom, how would folks, what's the best way to, to follow up on this conversation, get in touch with you um, at the chamber or um, yeah, uh, I suppose so. a home address, sure. so <laughs> sure yeah. you yeah, 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 LinkedIn, yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I, I mean, I think the Mac is a really quite good source of, yeah. of information, and, and we're trying to make it more so. Um, we're moving more towards sort of an, an, an evidence-based uh, policy okay. uh, set. The Atlanta Regional Commission also has some extremely good uh, resources on the metro area, um, and George Power does as well. That um, um, Again, I, I have to say there's a website, 33, to 33 North, Okay. Uh, which is our latitude, uh, right. which nice. is run That's by the good. which is run <laughs> by the Atlanta uh, Regional Commission, and they really do a, a very good job okay. of providing uh, micro data for the region. Absolutely. All right. So, um, in the last uh, minute here remaining, give us. I'm going to have you switch hats here. Give us your best elevator pitch, if you will, for the uh, chamber. Uh, why folks should get involved. Uh, maybe some announcements on the horizon, or what is a typical. Um, you know, they have different councils as well, so different from the sports sector to uh, uh, give us kind of right, a... We have a... We're, in, we're involved in, in sort of the, the essence of the um, community here in, in Atlanta. Sports, entertainment, uh, business, education, public policy. Um, if we are working to make the place better all the way around. And as I understand it, each of those sectors have their own councils and so forth, yes. so they have their own yeah, functions. We have, a, we have a large number of councils, advisory councils, yeah. community leaders that are involved in each of these segments that um, it's not really advising us. It's just a matter of uh, us convening the groups yeah, yeah. to work together uh, for the for the betterment of the metro area. Yeah, cr creating those uh, think tanks on those subject matter experts. Um, and again, they do after-hours events and um, right. luncheons and so and forth. And we can do I, the advantage of, of the chamber is that we can call upon a lot of expertise oh, yeah. all over the place uh, to address whatever issues seem to, to uh, come up that we need to, to deal with. 
Well, they've been at it apparently of 159 years. Yes, <laughs> so I yes, think they really think they very, figured <laughs> very long lived organization. I think they figured it yes. out by now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tom, uh, it was my pleasure having you in the studio here for uh, uh, this conversation about the Metro Atlanta Chamber. That's a lot of fun. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, absolutely. Uh, same here. So, um, look forward to continuing this conversation in the future and uh, stopping by the chamber, having more of these conversations. So, again, Rich Casanova on behalf of Keith Ippolito, our engineer, uh, another episode of the Georgia Business Radio. We'll see you next time. Thank you again for joining Rich Casanova and our guests on the Pro Business Channel. Use the social media links here to share today's show and stay tuned for the next episode of Georgia Business Radio.